A very good afternoon to everyone and uh, welcome to the i3 Emerging Markets webinar co-hosted with Tiro Price. I'm at Tech 10 with uh, i3 and I'm pleased to have uh, Ernest Young join me today. Ernest is a portfolio manager for the Emerging Markets Discovery Equity Strategy at uh, Tiro Price. Uh, he has 17 years of investment experience, 15 of which have been with Tiro Price. And prior to joining the firm in 2003, he was an analyst with HSBC Asset Management in London. Ernest earned a MA with honours in economics with Cambridge University and is a CFA charter holder. Now, more importantly about Ernest, um, congrats, in fact, on your recent performance where your fund gained some 17% over the past month. Now, this is probably too soon to get too excited for now, but certainly a relief after months of pain, I, I presume. So this recent uptick in uh, value stocks has uh, reignited the value versus growth investing debate. Now, has value finally turned the corner? Was it triggered by the vaccine announcements or something more? Uh, we're in for a fascinating discussion today. So in this webinar, uh, over the next 40 minutes, we'll attempt to address some of these issues, you know, star rotation, is there a regime change? Is value here for more than a while? Uh, EM or emerging markets versus developed markets, you know, with potential US dollar weakness, should we be more bullish about emerging markets? Uh, China gets a lot of coverage. How about India? And is oil getting attractive? But what's the downside? And the hunt for forgotten stocks, um, now what's that? Now I'll leave Ernest to elaborate a bit more on, on those details. So before I invite Ernest to share his research, just some admin matters. So this will be a short presentation with uh, slides that Ernest will go through for about 20 minutes. Thereafter, we'll spend the subsequent 20 minutes fielding questions and, and Q&A. So in the meantime, please type your questions into the question box and we'll endeavor to uh, answer them in the course of Q&A. So a, a disclaimer before we start, this webinar is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. It is intended for wholesale and institutional investors only. Over to you, Ernest. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have a very interesting presentation to you. I think I've met some of you before, so uh, welcome back to in the conversation with T. Rowe Price. For people we have not met, uh, uh, hopefully uh, next time we, when I travel to Australia, uh, we'll get to see you face to face. So the agenda today, I'm going to list uh, four main topics. First of all, very topical, uh, what is value investing as a style, both in the short-term outlook and in the long-term outlook. Secondly, EM has been uh, in a tough space this year. What is the outlook for the asset class as a whole? Uh, uh, third topic, what are we doing in our portfolio? And fourthly, we just give you a quick reminder of what kind of uh, mandate portfolio that we run. Now, in the first page in the content, uh, we are going to talk about uh, value investing as a, as a style. Just to redial your memory back, today everyone is saying value investing is dead. In the top box, you can see all the headlines. Actually, uh, if you look back at 20 years ago, we are saying exactly the same thing. Tech, tech disruption is nothing new. We talk about that killing value investing. Um, we argue that Warren Buffett, Benjamin Gramway was wrong 20 years ago. But if I show you in the next slide, I think it's no uh, surprising to you. Uh, last time when this kind of uh, headline came out in 99 and 2000, uh, it has actually brought us nearly a decade of uh, value outperformance from 2001 to nearly 2010. Now, you're familiar with this chart, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but one key thing I want to highlight is everyone knows this year is a big divergent year. If you look back at history in the last 20 years, growth and value as a style tend to move in the same direction, whether it's up market or down market. The difference, just the magnitude between the two. However, this time, this year is the first time in 20 years where you have value having a negative, big negative year, and growth have a big positive year. Now, so we have a freaky situation where we nearly have like a tech bubble on one side and a deep recession on the other side. And this kind of market we have not seen uh, any time in history. 
So what about the outlook for value? Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to talk about the short term first in the next slide. Um, in the next six to 12 months, we actually have conviction. At the left hand side of this chart, we plot global stimulus to asset. This is a T row generated chart. Basically, uh, the, 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 the top of the metric is how much stimulus is being pumped in the system, both fiscal and mandatory. At the bottom denominator is how much US dollar assets are out there. Well, how much assets are out there for people to buy in US dollar terms, right? You're talking about stock, bond, fixed, fixed uh, 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 currency, uh, real estate, etc. So this ratio is at the highest point ever. So we are actually pumping more liquidity in the system than more, more than the asset that we can buy. Now, if you flip this left-hand side chart upside down, you get the right-hand side chart. Uh, it actually has a loose correlation with the value versus growth uh, dynamic. You can see that uh, if we continue to pump this kind of um, uh, uh, stimulus, maybe we will have uh, some light at the end of the tunnel for value to catch up. Now, this is in the short term. Uh, our conviction is probably we'll get a cyclical uh, uh, recovery, textbook type like in 2016, like in 2009 coming out from uh, Lehman crisis. How about the longer term? So in the next page, I'm going to uh, give you a very simple framework thinking about it over the next three to five years. We actually think something has changed. It's not the only thing that will matter for regime, but I think it's important. Now, a lot of people say uh, uh, all the DM world, Europe, um, China, uh, US will become like Japan because no matter how you stimulate, nothing works. We actually notice uh, this is a very simple way to explain what is happening. Think about pre-COVID in the Europe crisis, in Lehman times, at Japan last 20 years. Central government and central bank pump a lot of money into banks and into zombie corporates. But all those money was used in recapping the balance sheet. Hence, there's no multiplied effect in the economy. That's why Japan has no growth for 20 years. There's no inflation for 20 years because every Joe in the economy do not benefit from the stimulus. Uh, they benefit low interest rate and asset owners and tycoons, etc. But if you're a salary earner, you don't feel it. Now, post-COVID, something has changed. Government realized that just low interest rate is not working anymore. So this time, first of all, they did not pump the banks. Zero stimulus into the banks. Secondly, very little money gone into struggling uh, uh, corporates. In Australia, closer to home, you know, Virgin Australia has gone bust. But Quanta hardly received any subsidy from the government. Uh, hotel industry hardly received any subsidy from government. Most of the subsidy went straight into people's pocket as unemployment benefit, as furlough funds in the UK, as helicopter money. We actually think this kind of stimulus have multiplied effect. And this is a major change compared to what happened in the last 10 to 20 years. And perhaps this way of deploying stimulus will determine the economic growth and potential for reflation in the next three to five years. Now, let me show you some tangible evidence in the next page. Um, this is plotting the money supply uh, of major countries. Like I mentioned to you, Japan has tried everything, the gray line. They have tried zero interest rate, they have tried fiscal policy. Interestingly, the money supply of Japan never accelerated. However, recently it did. Something has changed because the way of deploying stimulus has changed. We know what happened in the US and Europe. There's even more money being pumped in the system with helicopter style. So multiplier is kicking in now and it's something that is different compared to last few years. Another important point that we want to flag to you for potential longer term implication in the next page is uh, the direction of the US dollar. It's no surprising to everyone. Everyone's talking about potential US dollar weakening. A lot of people argue maybe it's just a short term phenomenon. Let me show you this chart. The light blue line is the US fiscal deficit. The dark blue line is US dollar index. It has a loose correlation. 
the correlation actually is also echoing the political cycle in the US. Now, we actually think no matter Trump or Biden, they're going to pursue similar policy. Biden has explicitly said that he will stimulate the economy, infrastructure planning. Yarlan has said the same. So that light blue line is going to revert very, very quickly. And if there's a sticky fiscal deficit in the US, uh, it will determine a, a possible prolonged weaker US dollar. And that has knock on impact across a lot of asset class. It matters for Aussie equities, it matters for European equities, it matters for real assets like oil, like gold, like iron ore. So uh, last 10 years, we have had a, a US dollar strength. If US dollars start to turn, uh, the regime could be very different. So in the next page, let me summarize what we're going to say, we're saying here on the value side. First of all, value is more forgotten than any time before, huge divergent, maximum point of pain. We think in the short term, which we define as six to 12 months, uh, there's good chance of we are having a recovery. But the key for you to keep in mind is there's a structural change in how governments stim stimulating the economy. Possibly that is aligning some star for a regime change for the longer term beyond 12 months. I cannot say for sure, but this is something that I advise everyone to put on your radar. Now, I've just talked about value as a style. So in the next section, we are going to talk about uh, emerging markets. Emerging market has been a pretty bad asset class. Now the headline index doesn't show you the picture because the headline index is probably up, you know, five to 10% year to date. Most of that in the last one month. Underneath all the return of emerging market was driven by that narrow leadership. And I think everyone in this forum knows if you look at Brazil, Russia, non-tech, you know, infrastructure stocks and bank stocks, they're down 20%, 15% and there's no way near year-to-date flattish. Now, why is that? Why is everyone discerning emerging market? And this is a simple way to explain it because everyone felt very nervous about FX. And I think of FX with a simple framework, fiscal, current account, and real rates. Fiscal blew up everywhere around the world, including Australia. So first point of call is, you know, all these currencies are going to be weak, get out. However, I want to flag to this group that it's not all bad. Current account of EM has changed a lot. It's the automatic cyclical adjustment that we see in every cycle. Brazil is having the best current account surplus in the last 10 years. Uh, South Africa, weak currency, but is having the narrowest current account deficit in 10 years. A uh, real rate, although it's hovering around zero and some negative, but it's still at a good carry versus the negative rate in the US. So two out of the three pillar for FX is actually either anchor or slightly getting better. So the key for us to determine what happened to FX is actually what happened to the fiscal. And I'll give you a very simple uh, chart in the next page. We actually think fiscal has seen the worst, probably is gonna get better. Now it's a very busy chart. The simple way to explain it is the light blue bar is GDP driven fiscal deficit. GDP collapse, fiscal deficit expand. If GDP comes back, the light blue bar is going to narrow. The dark blue bar is new stimulus, i.e. helicopter money. Now this chart basically tells you two main messages. One is most EM is on the right hand side. So fiscal get destroyed everywhere around the world, but in EM, it's not as bad as DM. Secondly, most of the EM is cyclical. If GDP bounce back, we actually think the fiscal will improve. Whereas in the DM side, because there's a lot of furlough fund, a lot of unemployment benefit that are very sticky, it's very hard to withdraw very quickly. So in the DM side, the dark blue bar is much larger and maybe it is more structural. So why do we think that fiscal probably has seen the worst? And in the next page, I'll give you two very simple chart. Now everyone is talking, still talking about lockdown, lockdown. Lockdown is a DM phenomenon, it is in Victoria state, it is in Europe, it is in US. In EM, actually today there's no lockdown because 
EMs are all hand-to-mouth economy. If you lock people down, people would have no food, have no money, no savings. So you're seeing that in most of the EM country, economic recovery is bouncing like a V. Hence, if you tie it back to my previous slide, we don't need to change the slide. If you think about it as GDP is bouncing back, probably those fiscal deficit is bouncing back with a lag. So we have, we've probably seen the worst point of EMFX and it's going to improve from here. How much improvement, I don't know. It's not my job to predict, but my conviction is we've seen the worst. Now, I've talked a lot about top down. So in the next slide, I'm going to talk about bottom up for the EM Opportunity Center. Simple chart, plotting the free cash flow coming out from the value pockets and from the growth pockets. Now, normally in a downturn, uh, value stocks get destroyed because banks need to be recapped. Energy company go bankrupt. Material company go bankrupt. This time, actually, all these companies do not need recapitalization. They're actually very strong and they're pumping up free cash flow. This is not your usual recession because it was very deep, but very quick. So it hardly destroyed any of the traditional uh, cyclical industry. It don't get me wrong, it did destroy some like airlines and restaurants and hotel. But if you think about the broader economy, the impact is actually very small. So let me sum up in the next slide what my what I'm thinking uh, is on the emerging market opportunity set. It's been horrible this year. We've had 35 weeks of consecutive outflow. I've done this job for 17 years. I've never seen that in my career. Every single week, money move out. Now we understand why, because FX perception was very weak. Fiscal perception was very weak. We are trying to argue that fundamental probably at trough. Current account is getting better. Real rate is anchor. Probably GDP and fiscal is getting better too. We think there's a big disconnection between what the market is pricing, especially in the cyclical segment versus fundamentals. The cyclical, sec cyclical sector is actually not that worse off compared, compared to previous downturns. Now we talk about value, we talk about EM, let's talk about what are the opportunity in the next section. Now this is a very interesting slide that we're gonna show you. We plot four toll road stocks around the world. Uh, China, Brazil, France, and Mexico. Completely different lockdown cycle, completely different traffic cycle for toll road. Stocks behave the same in this chart, right? It doesn't make sense. It just shows us that there's like this one factor tray, everything COVID on, COVID off, and COVID off gets sold off, regardless of what happened with toll road traffic in China growing 11% whereas in France is minus 21%. Now, another interesting chart along this line, uh, in the next chart, in the next slide, is uh, we plot uh, EU banks versus Brazilian ETF, one-to-one -one relationship this year. It should not happen this way. So to me, this is a big disconnection, it's a one-factor trade. So for stock pickers, we should have the opportunity to make a difference. And now in the next slide, we're gonna show you where we're finding opportunities. Now government knee-jerk lockdown, market knee-jerk sell everything COVID off. On the left-hand side of this chart, we all know the story with cyclicals. Energy, horrible, horrible in oil and gas. Uh, 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 banks, corporate banks, retail banks, all get sold off. That's a traditional cyclical side of value. Now how about this steady eddy side in the middle? Utilities, right? Airports, water, gas, all got sold. Now, the interesting thing is on the right-hand side, these are traditional quality growth sector that all mainstream guys want to uh, own, but they get sold off as well. So for us in this portfolio, although we are contrarian, we have a value tilt. We are actually buying all these sectors. We are finding so much uh, opportunity with good risk reward. We are not just buying traditional cyclical value space of oil and airlines and coal mines, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, we don't own coal mines, uh, but we're finding good opportunity that is going, getting thrown out with the bath water and we're buying previous fallen angel that everyone wants to own. Now, a bit more in the next slide for you on country allocation that we, are, we, we have been uh, deploying. 
because this is a contrarian value to portfolio. So we historically, we always have a massive underweight in India, always very expensive, very popular. Everyone is there, got, th got thrown out with bath water. So we actually find a lot of interesting ideas, especially on the domestic cyclical side in India. The gray line shows you that uh, historical big underweight through COVID, we've been buying and buying and buying. Now we are 2% overweight. Uh, how about, uh, wow, well, you, you, you can challenge me, say, Ernest, you are a uh, value contrarian fund. So by buying India, you must be cheating and going back to core and growth. In the next slide, we're going, going to show you by making all these changes, buying Fallen Angel of uh, airports and cosmetic companies and IT companies, we have not changed the skin of the game. This is a typical factor skyline. We showed you that what the portfolio looked like today and what does the portfolio look like in December. Even when we are buying all these opportunities, even when we are going overweight on India, our factor skyline have not changed. We continue to capture value factors in this portfolio. So in just to give you a very quick summary in the next slide uh, of the opportunity set, uh, we think a lot of this connection in the market. One factor trade, uh, people don't think about fundamental, they think about perception of COVID on versus COVID off. We actually argue that this year is not about growth with that, it's about that group of stay home, COVID on versus uh, go outside, COVID off. In the COVID off segment, there's both growth and value stocks. So we are finding a lot of ideas. We have gone overweight in India first time in our history. So that's just one example to show you that there's a connection and we are finding those uh, opportunities that we did not find before. Now I'm coming up to the 20 minute mark. So I'm, I'm going to give you two more slides uh, before we uh, open for question. So what exactly we do in this portfolio? The people who met me on this forum, uh, you know that we run a contrarian portfolio that we like to invest in for cotton stocks. Now, why do we do it? Because we think that uh, the left-hand side is how most mainstream investors see the EM opportunity set. Uh, a lot of fund managers will come into your office and say that, hey, uh, EM is a very dangerous, high-risk place, very volatile, but there's like 200, 300, very high quality, very good ESG company. And they focus all their money, all their research into that pocket. And then they will tell you that the rest of the universe, thousand, two thousand stock, you know, not really good, toxic. That's how we outperform. Now that's on the right hand side, this is how we view the opportunity set. We actually in no disagreement. We think that 200, 300 stock is really high quality. It's really high ESG. They are good compounders. But we actually think that there's a big group in the middle called average, average quality, average ESG. We don't actually need to go to the deep end of really poor governance company to capture the value factor. If you do your research right in this average group, we are betting on average becoming better. And this will be enough to earn you that value contrarian factor. If we do our research right, our experience is picking in this pocket, you get good risk return, and you probably get 30, 50 percent upside over two to three years. Now, if we're very lucky in this average group, we pick a stock that graduated into high quality. It doesn't happen all the time. It does happen from, you know, one or two occasions. We get 100 percent upside return. So we combine that with our fundamental stock picking, with our ESG analysis to try to pick a value contrarian portfolio. Now, to sum up, in the final slide that I'm going to present to you, uh, what did we talk about in the last 20 minutes? Now, the bear sentiment is not only in value, it's in EM as well. It's near historical peak, 20 year peak. Now, the divergent is not about growth and value, it's about COVID and COVID off this year. Now, it's presenting us with a lot of bottom up ideas. Remember, we think there's a structural change in how government stimulate economy now. Now, we have conviction in the near term because there's so much pent up demand and liquidity are being pumped in the system. But if they continue to deploy helicopter money, it will have implicate the longer term and potential regime change on value and on US dollar. Bottom up, 
it's not that risky. We are finding a lot of company with good balance sheet with a lot of free cash flow. So this is giving us a lot of opportunity to buy it. To just sum up this year, very tough for EM, very tough for a value manager. But at the same time, another side of my brain is saying that I've never seen that much fertile uh, opportunity hunting ground in most part of my career. So uh, tech has reappeared. So I'm going to uh, pause, take a sip of water, uh, open up for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ernest. Um, for the audience that's uh, with us, I encourage you to uh, enter your questions in, in the box. And as it comes through, uh, I will post uh, hopefully the hard questions to Ernest. Uh, but uh, Ernest, uh, intrigued by your, your point around, let's forget about value growth. Let's talk COVID on, COVID off. Now, before I drill down a bit into that, um, your last point, you talk about average companies getting better. Um, and I was keen for you, perhaps you could uh, elaborate. You talk about average and, and in the ESG slide, about average ESG. So uh, a little confused. What, what do you mean by average ESG? Are you talking about sort of a, like a double standard? I mean, I know ESG standards in developed countries, OECD countries, Australia and the like, obviously with a very high standard. Emerging markets has its challenges. So how do you view ESG? What's, what's your definition? And, and what do you mean by average ESG maybe getting better? Sure. So we know that when we speak to Australian clients, we have to talk about ESG. So we actually prepared in advance an ESG slide for you. So Sophie, if you don't mind going to page uh, the next page, uh, we'll touch on this topic. Now, we give you two boxes. Now, one of the frustration we have is now all the talks about ESG is actually set by OECD DM standard. We actually find that a lot in a lot of cases it does not or are very hard to apply in the EM space. In, in the OECD, in the DM, because they're a rich country, you have a choice to substitute. You have a choice to make difference. You have a choice to not uh, uh, engage with some activity uh, and for the others. But in EM, in frontier market, we actually do not have this choice. People do not have that wealth. So I think we need from time to time we need to be more pragmatic. Now, I'm not, not going to spend a lot of time on the first box because everyone talks about it. Now, if a company engage in harmful activity, harmful behavior, polluting the environment, you know, we should not invest in them. We believe that too. Uh, so let's park that argument. But where we are thinking more and argue more is how to adopt some of that to EM. For example, most banks we invest in, uh, uh, in EM have engaged in, uh, unfortunately, had, had data breaches, had uh, corruption by individuals, had uh, anti-laundering uh, incidents. But uh, some of that was uh, occurred 10 years ago, uh, uh, eight years ago, and they've made an effort to change. A lot of time, the external provider of ASG scores are very slow to upgrade those scores. So we will go in, and we'll recognize that snow, slowness and we recognize that uh, common theme across that particular sector, we'll try to overrule that. The key is to engage with them to make sure that they have a system in place and they're not going to do that again. Now, actually in EM, there's a lot of uh, uh, product uh, cannot be substituted very, very quickly. In Australia, uh, you can say that we don't want coal fire power station. We don't want PET bottles. You can't do it because you have money to afford it. Now think about Africa and India. The safest way to transport clean water to remote part, to schools, to kids, is PET bottles. They cannot afford to ship a big glass container or aluminum cans, right? So in those circumstances, we need to think, do we want to ban PET bottle in India? Because that will have knock on impact on clean water supply to those countries. So these are just small examples that we want to show you that, you know, on one hand, we completely agree with ESG, certain industry, the hurdle rate is so high that we probably will never touch them no matter how cheap they are. But in certain other pockets, we cannot apply that form uh, DM standards on investing in EM. And I just give you two or three examples there, but I'm sure if we continue, we can talk two hours about this. Thank, thank you, um, Ernest. Um, Going back to, I guess, the COVID on, COVID off, and you had a slide, and we don't need to go into that. Uh, with the examples of sectors that you feel 
will will pick up. For example, you mentioned airports or airlines. Um, I had, in fact, uh, recently the, the pleasure of speaking to an infrastructure investor, direct investor, where they had loads, you know, um, invested in in airports. The the commentary was that yes, been hard hit, but the problem is that while you expect demand to come back at some stage, it's not going to come back for a while, and they've gone on to even on the record to say, look, it's too uncertain to forecast. Hence, it's saying, okay, we'll, we'll hold off and not do anything. However, in your commentary, you have been very positive on, on airports or airlines. Can you, can you explain? Uh, sure. I think I'll actually ask Sophie to go back to page 17 because uh, we have done a lot of work in this, uh, in, along this theme, and we are very, very excited about some of the items you see. So, so let's take text. Uh, a point about uh, our competitor talking about airports and airlines. Um, so, uh, the next slide, uh, Sobi, uh, sorry, page 18. Um, so let's take uh, airlines and airports. We did a lot of work in the last 10 months. Uh, we do not have the courage to buy an airline today. So similar to that competitor, we're saying that, you know, because the balance sheet is not anchored, uh, the, the, the biggest enemy to a contrarian value investor is the balance sheet. If we can't we can't anchor it, uh, we can lose 100%. Right? However, uh, we have bought two airports in this portfolio. Now, wh what give us the conviction? First of all, remember the point I made about uh, this COVID perception is also very DM-centric. Lockdown is a DM phenomenon. Guess what? In China, in India, in Brazil, in Mexico, people are flying. The low factor of those airlines in the domestic route is back to 80, 70%. So when we pick airport, we actually find some good opportunity where the airport is tailored for both domestic and international traffic. International uncertainty is high, but domestic the, the visibility is actually much clearer. So the downside is anchored by the domestic traffic. The upside from resumption of international traffic is an option value. If it doesn't come, the stock doesn't blow up. If it comes, it goes up. So for example, we bought a Mexican, Mexican airport that has the lot, there's three of them, but we bought the one that has the largest, ex largest exposure to domestic traffic. So that helped us to anchor the downside. Now, another way to think about this is, remember, a uh, uh, stock market always discount changes early. Now, we still don't know when vaccine come to Australia and Hong Kong, but if the vaccine is coming in Q3 next year, stock should be moving now. It always discounts six to eight months early. So we can't wait for that visibility before we buy stocks. Now, Tech, if you allow me, let me tell you another funny story. You see, we put in this chart on the right-hand side, cosmetics. Why, why cosmetic is COVID off? Uh, my wife inspired me, my lady colleague inspired me on because one day my wife came into my room and said, I'm going outside and I'm buying uh, makeup. And I'm like, why are you buying makeup? Because she said she'd been locked down and away from the office last six months. She didn't need to use any of that cosmetics. So it, it went from a staple consumption into a cyclical consumption and the cyclical consumption went to zero. But then because we are resuming in every country slowly, although wearing masks, we're going back to the office. So you need to put makeup on your eyes, right? When you put take off the mask in the office, you need to put full makeup on. And in, in, remember, the cosmetic bottles has a very short shelf life. It expires very quickly. So if you have not used it in the last 10 months, you need to replenish. So <laughs> cosmetic used to be a very structural, staple consumption. COVID on, COVID off, thrown into COVID off end, but we are finding that opportunity and we are buying it. Uh, certainly a nice story. Let, let me continue to take you on, um, I guess, what is so-called, I mean, when we think about value sector, you know, traditional value sectors, you have financials, energy, materials. Materials, we get that. Let's say financials. I, I get the fact that, look, this is not like the last crisis. The bank's balance sheet are not better. They, they're fine. Um, but I guess thinking in a different way, banks have this other headwind. You've got interest rates, again, depending on which country you're talking about, either close to zero or, or zero thereabouts. 
that in itself is a it's one hit win, I would say, for banks and financials. And, and secondly, uh, again, depending on which territory you're talking about, um, technology, um, in some places you've got new banks, you know, uh, the, the existing banks have legacy systems that may or may not have upgraded their technology system to be able to compete in so-called, you know, the new world in a sense. Um, would that be sufficient headwinds to say, well, are we really sure that banks will turn around? Your thoughts? Yeah, let, let me give a simple framework to think about banks. Now, we, we recognize all those structural challenges, right? However, a lot of those structural challenges are lesser in emerging market than in developed markets. In emerging market, don't forget, most yield curve are still steep, steep upwards. So they will make money from them. They're not like Europe, US, Japan, and Australia. Right? So that's one difference because there's inherent business cycle in emerging markets and there's inflation in emerging markets. So I am speaking from a uh, different base compared to an Australian fund manager. Okay, that's point number one. Now, if you think about what you described, banks are under attack from rates, reflation, deflation potential, technology, and this year, cyclical COVID off, right? COVID so far is becoming clearer and clearer that the, the, the recessionary pressure is not as much as we previously expected. Unemployment is not blowing up because uh, governments are pumping. All the moratorium is turned out to be not as that nasty. So I think the pressure from the cyclical COVID side slowly, slowly lessening. It's not going away, but it's much less than what we expect at the earlier part of this year. Technology in the middle will always be there. So let's park it for now. Uh, uh, the pressure stay. Now on the deflation side, I think it's very important. Remember, a few slides ago, Sophie, you don't need to uh, go back. Is we showed you the change in policy on helicopter money. We showed you the change in money supply. If those trends continue, is very stimulative. Maybe now we finally will see GDP growth and domestic activity of country accelerate. If that happens, it will be reflationary. Now, I don't know how long it's going to last. We have visibility, like I said, in six to 12 months. Can it last three years? It could if government continue to stimulate that way. Thank you, um, Ernest. I have a question um, from one someone in the audience, uh, and the question reads: Where in the capitalization spectrum are there are the better opportunities? I think the market is very very efficient um, along the market cap scale, and I think the uh, emergence of ETF passive smart beta has made it even more efficient. Because smart beta, we know that is a big topic in Australia. Smart beta just tend to buy the large cap because they're index stocks. And they tend not to buy the really tail end of the market cap spectrum. So I would say that it used to be efficient like that. Now it's efficient like this, right? So it goes back to the same mid cap is less liquid, is less efficient. Large cap, very efficient. But remember now we have COVID on and COVID off. So even at the large cap liquid space, we have a big divergence. All the money last 10, 10, 10, 10 months went into tech, went into um, uh, healthcare, but even the, like, like in this chart, we are seeing previous growth darling has become a forgotten angels. So I would, I would argue that even in the large cap space, there is inefficiency. Thank you. I, I have um, a burning question which I need to ask you regard, relating in fact to the slide that you have here. We'll finish off on the value sectors and then there's a the question in the audience around geopolitics. Um, staying on value sectors, oil. Uh, you had a comment that oil was attractive. Um, as you can be aware, you know, there's, there's an energy transition revolution going on. When I think of oil, yes, there's peak oil, there's the risk of stranded assets. Maybe that's in the longer term. Uh, but are you saying that there's still good demand now that oil with the valuation in pricing is attractive despite the risk of stranded assets? Yeah, so uh, uh, it's a big topic for us. So we actually prepare another slide for you is uh, immediately after the ESG slide. 
Uh, people ask us a lot about this. Now, we, we recognize the structural negative of ESG on oil. We totally get it. So we've started with this portfolio five years ago. We have always, always on a big negative weight on oil. So just keep that in mind. So we understand that negative thesis. But this year in COVID low, we actually feel that this is probably the once in 10 year chance to make some money on oil. So we took our negative weight into overweight. The thesis is very simple. If you look at the right hand side chart, first of all, the left hand side chart shows you the dark blue line is our energy weighting. So I'm not lying to you. We've always been very negative on this asset class. Uh, on the right hand side, our thesis basically says when oil breaks, the green line is its cash cost. If oil price do not return to the light blue line at the top, oil supply continue to shrink. Today is not a demand story. It's not that we are trying to play air travel resuming. We are actually thinking supply of oil, rightly so, is shrinking massively in the next few years because the current share, uh, oil price do not incentivize any capex. Remember, if you study ESG as well, which we do a lot, the pressure on the US shell company on the total on BP is so big today that they're switching off all the capex. So we just think that supply will continue and continue to shrink. And in the next 12 months, when you have a reacceleration of demand, road traffic, uh, people can fly from Sydney to Perth again, to Australia, uh, to, to New Zealand again, to Hong Kong again. You have a demand upsuit and you have a big fall in supply. And we think that's the moment you can make some money from oil. But this is probably an 18 to 20 more month thesis. And after that, we actually agree that the structural uh, 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 headwind will come back. Thank you, Ernest. And uh, just the, the last uh, couple of minutes. Uh, Inevitably, when we talk about emerging markets, you can't get away from geopolitics. But, but I'm keen to get your views, um, not so much at the high level, really, uh, but you know, investment implications. So the, the question in uh, from the audience is, does the new US administration have any implications on you know, EM you know, investments for China, for US? Your thoughts on that? They will have an inf implication on, on EM. Uh, and China, not through geopolitics. It's back to the key point I, I highlighted, is how they manage the US economy. Biden and Yalen has openly come out and say that we're not gonna do anything, do anything to China now, we're not gonna U-turn any of the Trump policy because the number one priority for now is fix COVID and fix the economy. I.e., the overall uh, stimulus stance of Biden is the same as Trump. And that's why I keep going back to the same thing, the helicopter money slide, the money supply slide, and the US dollar slide. That is the most important thing for all of us. How they deal with Russia, how they deal with China, occasionally it will grab a lot of headline, but I think fundamentally it won't have impact more than you know three months. And we've seen that with Trump administration. Last one year, Trump has been attacking China every single week. And I'm surprised how they come up with new things that they attack China with. New sanction, new restriction, et cetera, et cetera. Look at the Chinese stock market. It just powered through, right? Look at the emerging market. It just powered through, through this volatility. So back to my point, I'm not just dreaming. I actually think that geopolitics on this US-China relationship Right now, I show the most important thing is really macro and how they stimulate the economy. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have. Uh, this has been really interesting and fascinating. I mean, from starting to talk about growth versus value, we've ended up with uh, COVID off, COVID on and COVID off, and, and potentially is thinking, look, geopolitics, yep, headlines, but let's get down to business. The economy powers on. On that note, um, thank you very much, Ernest, for sharing our thoughts and for Tiro Price for co-hosting. And to the audience, uh, I trust this has been meaningful. Thank you, and we hope to see you next time. Stay well. Thank Bye -bye. you all.